Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's graph reading group. Where we have Zhu Jung from Rafa Gomi Bomarelli's lab uh, explaining us her paper, how to undo coarse graining of proteins. Hello, uh, my name is Zhu Jung, and I'm from MIT Rafa Gomez Bomarelli group. And then today I'm excited to talk about my recent preprint, uh, which is chemically transferable generative back mapping of coarse grain proteins. So uh, coarse graining and back mapping of proteins are important problems for structural bio. And at the same time, I think it's very interesting question for generative modeling community because it's um, very tightly connected to learning the distribution of conformations conditioned on some global geometry. So in this talk, I will uh, explore the possibility of making it chemically transferable. And before we jump into the main contents, I first want to describe the glossary. So what is core screening? What does it mean, make chemically transferable? That, we, that you mean that we can generalize across molecules? Yes, yes, exactly. Okay. Yep, yep. So uh, coarse graining is basically going from all up to resolution to some higher level resolution. Like uh, in this case, in this example is residue level. Uh, each amino acid is, uh, a set of atoms in one amino acid is, you know, combined and then considered as one bead. That is coarse graining, and the back mapping is to go reverse, uh, going from one amino acid, one bead to all optimum resolution is back mapping. And then what I mean by chemically transferable is, I believe uh, everyone here might know what I'm talking about, but uh, still, it's. Uh, it's just that I want to develop a method that is applicable to arbitrary chemical systems, arbitrary proteins, uh, to give inference even for the proteins that I didn't use for training. Okay, so uh, in my talk today, I will first introduce the problem uh, of bank mapping of coarse grain proteins, and then I will introduce the previous work from our group uh, where uh, they formulated bound mapping as a generative modeling problem. And then I'll introduce uh, my research question, which is, uh, can generative bound mapping be chemically transferable? And then I, the answer is yes, uh, given some conditions. Um, and then I named my bound mapper ZenZProd uh, because it generates Z matrix, which is internal coordinates of the protein all atom structures. And then I will um, introduce some assumptions and then key modeling details. And I will show the results and uh, analyze on how the modeling detail contributed to the model performance. And then we can sum it up. So first, I think we need to understand the protein structures doesn't exist in just one single snapshot. Um, it has, it can have many, many different conformations, and then it'll, like, we can describe this on the energy landscape. So, for example, here, uh, we have, like, um, the x-axis is the conformational uh, axis, y-axis is energy. We can have, like, these uh, two main states. Um, and then by uh, using crystallography-based method, we can, like, just get one snapshot. And then like uh, some other NMR prior EM, uh, those methods, we can get like more structures, but then, um, and then in this energy landscape, uh, obviously like going from here to, can you guys see my cursor? My yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so maybe going from here to here, it doesn't take a lot of time. Um, but like if we want to go from here to here, we need to overcome the energy barrier. So um, it'll take a lot of time, uh, like when we want to, you know, simulate uh, or, for example, perform molecular dynamic simulations um, because it's like probable that uh, because the step size is so small, it's probable that like it gets stuck at some point and then you know, it takes really long time to get to another state. 
So that's uh, where the core screening comes in. So the idea is uh, we can simulate large systems in longer time scales by making systems simpler. So in very high level, uh, if we want to move like all these objects uh, one at a time, then it'll take a long time. But if we put everything in a box and then move the box, then yeah, it'll be much quicker. So the idea is that, but sometimes uh, we need to zoom in again. So for example, if these confirmations are uh, the ones that we can get from all lots of molecular dynamics, uh, coarse grained molecular dynamics would have, you know, a larger step size. So it might not be able to get all the, you know, required confirmations. So what if we need like something here? What if we need something here? Then we will have to go back to the all atom resolution and then like get the structure here, like do more uh, simulation here or here. But then back mapping is not one-to-one -one problem, but one-to-many problem. So uh, the core screen confirmation here can correspond to many uh, all atom confirmations. So it is difficult to solve with deterministic rule-based methods. So this is why it's a very interesting generative modeling problem. And then um, this is a prior work from our group, uh, Wang et al. Um, this work first formulated the bank mapping problem as generative modeling problem. So the idea is um, <clears throat> we have this distribution of all atom structures. And then uh, we have the distribution of coarse grained uh, structure. Now the problem is um, achieving the conditional generative model, uh, like the probability of all atom structure uh, condition on the coarse grain structure. So this is Uji's uh, VAE framework uh, where he um, expanded the, our goal, uh, the conditional distribution on the you know, coarse grain structure large X uh, as a decoder times prior. Um, here the decoder, well, here the prior um, takes the large X, the CG, the coarse grained structure as this condition and then um, generates the latent space vector. And then the decoder takes the latent space vector and then the, uh, the condition, the coarse grain structural condition, and then outputs the, um, the uh, all atom structure. And then to learn the decoder and prior, we introduce this encoder uh, where it takes the all atom structure and then tries to reconstruct the, um, trying to map it to latent space. And here still the, uh, everything is conditioned on the coarse grain structure. So the learning objective is uh, it's condition of VAE. So um, we learned uh, from elbow, like minimizing elbow. Uh, the re we want to minimize the reconstruction loss uh, between the, you know, uh, the true sample and the reconstructed sample. And then we want to minimize the KL divergence between the encoder and prior. And now um, this is, this was my research question, can back mapping be made transferable? So in UGS previous formulation, um, it's like, it is trained on each system, each chemical system, which means like each protein. So we needed uh, the data to train to achieve the entire uh, landscape, entire distribution. But uh, what if we only have a lot of data for like only the part of the landscape or like even like if we don't have like any of the data, then we wouldn't be able to you know, the model wouldn't be able to really extrapolate. But uh, because there are, like protein structures are very repetitive. 
um, even like especially for small tiny like local structures, local motifs. So why don't we find those uh, local examples from a lot of like stru protein structural data out there and then give inference. Just like AlphaFold, um, they trained on many, the model so many, many different protein structures so that it can give inference to, you know, arbitrary sequence. So this situation is, uh, so we know that like protein structures can be learned transferably, but then now the question is, can uh, protein conformational distribution, the density uh, be learned transferably? And then now the question would be to learn it in a transferable manner how local the back mapping should be. So it's like really difficult to infer the entire energy, energy conformational landscape uh, from for like each system. Um, but the assumption is the hypothesis here is at least maybe we can, we will be able to infer it locally because proteins share, you know, some local uh, structure, local motifs. So how local we should go? That's the question. And then our uh, work is um, proof of concept study that um, tries to show that in the from the residual level, it's okay to go to all atom level. So um, the hypothesis is Local geometry in residual level resolution is sufficient to infer protein fine-grained uh, all atom structures. So um, in other words, the task is to go from C alpha trace. So C alpha is a uh, carbon that every amino acid has. Um, so basically it's going from residual level to all atom structure. And then um, the intuition is if we know uh, what's surrounding the uh, residue of interest, then we'll be able to find the all atomistic structure of that residue. So for example, in this example, um, this tryptophan is surrounded by this leucine and aspirin and the lysine. Um, and then if we know the, you know, like the identity uh, of those surrounding residues and then uh, how they will like how they are oriented, then we'll be able to, you know, figure out that, okay, so here, uh, tryptophan, this um, side chain has some nitrogen, and then these uh, backbones will have oxygen, which can form hydrogen bonding. So, you know, we can, we'll be able to find that, uh, find this uh, specific geometry. Not that the model will reason like what I just did, but um, that's the intuition. So now we need a data to train the protein confirmations on. And then this is what I used, Protein Ensemble Database. It is pretty recently released. Uh, the most recent update was 2021. And then this is a database of structural ensembles of uh, intrinsically disordered proteins or uh, intrinsically disordered protein and globular protein complexes. So why I chose this database is because it includes uh, protein structures of variety of disorderedness. Um, when we just train on like globular, like not really flexible proteins, then like the statistics will be different from those of uh, very flexible proteins, even the uh, local level, very local level confirmations. So this database uh, had many structures of uh, various disorderness. Uh, so I thought it would be sufficient to represent the uh, uh, general statistics. And also the ensembles, like the databases, uh, the da database for ensembles, which means for each protein entries, it has, um, uh, there are like many confirmations um, that follow the Boltzmann 
uh, distribution in general. So they are computationally generated and is experimentally constrained um, using some NMR based NMR or uh, small angle X-ray scattering uh, measurements. And then uh, there were total in total 227 entries, but then uh, after cleaning up the data, uh, I used 84 proteins for training and four proteins uh, each for validation and testing. Um, although there, although I used only 84 entries uh, in total, like because each entry has many confirmations in total, like there were uh, more than 10K protein confirmations used. Um, and then I believe uh, the audience here would be familiar with equivariant message passing. So um, yeah, previously I uh, explained that our assumption is that the surrounding geometry determines the 3D placement of atoms of each residue. So we need to find a way to encode the surrounding geometry well. Um, here, uh, the encoder, our encoder uses three levels of uh, graph com 3D graph convolutions, which is residue to residue message passing um, to, you know, make the, this node know what, what kind of residues are surrounding uh, itself. And then also atom atom wise um, encoding, and there's also residue atom level like cross encoding. And then this way, uh, we thought that the model could learn the orientation and geometry very well um, to achieve the nice residue-wise latent space embedding. And the prior only takes the uh, coarse grain structure as its input. So it only has this residue-residue uh, level message passing. But then because the encoder and prior are trained to match each other by minimizing KL divergence, uh, we hope that, you know, the prior will, uh, as the message passing proceeds, um, the residue will be able to, uh, like, decide its orientation uh, depending on what's surrounding itself. And then the architecture is analogous to diff doc, uh, which uh, the host today, Hannes, uh, developed uh, its score model. So DiffDoc is a docking, uh, it's formulated docking problem as generator modeling problem. Um, and then the situation is analogous here because uh, DiffDoc's score model um, has two interacting <clears throat> identities, which is receptor and ligand. Um, and then here we have residue and atom. So the architecture is uh, very similar. So thanks to Hannes. And then uh, for the decoder, we chose internal coordinates as its degrees of freedom because uh, first of all, we can have better control over topology. We can, because the uh, bond lengths, um, bond angles, which are uh, more constrained variables compared to the torsional angles, um, they are, they have like very narrow, um, like plausible distribution. So we can have better control over that. And then the distribution uh, of each variable is easier for the generative model to learn. So here, uh, this figure shows the, um, uh, the distribution of torsional angle, one torsional angle example. And then this figure shows the distribution of um, one atom's x axis coordinates. And then you can see that uh, torsional angles, it's more like multimodal Gaussian uh, from our bare eyes. And then this Cartesian coordinates. Uh, yeah, yes, Hannes. How did Wuji do his decoding or also his encoding? Yeah, so Wuji is. Initial model, it's called CGVAE. It used Cartesian coordinates as output. But then it wasn't that much of a problem because uh, he only trained on one uh, system. So the model could, you know, it was 
there yeah. were more information. And then also uh, what he tested was on chignolin and alanine dipeptide, which are like tiny, tiny proteins. So it wasn't, I think it wasn't like that much of a heart problem. But then when yeah. I, yeah. Okay, and here you now decide to instead um, have your decoder produce Cartesian coordinates for the, the alpha carbons and um, internal coordinates for all the other atoms around the, like for once for the, like a specific set of internal coordinates for the backbone atoms because they always stay the same. And then for each type of side chain, uh, you also have uh, like an internal parametrization. Yep, 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 exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the and... uh, Cartesian coordinates of the C alpha atoms are given because it's, you know, coarse graining. Like it's conditioned on the C alpha oh, like, yeah. structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, the side chains with cycles, what do you do anything about the cycles? Oh, that's a good question. So I have actually I implemented both like first version, not doing anything for the cycles. Second version, uh, you know, if there's a ring, uh, if there's a ring like this, uh, if we know the three structure, like three, uh, three D placements of these three atoms, then other three are almost automatically determined. So I tried using rule-based algorithm to just predict the mm -hmm. uh, three atoms in a ring and then automatically determines the other three. But then the um, model performance hasn't really changed much. So yeah, but isn't, guess... the, isn't this the usual example that you have like a um a bathtub as your six ring or you can have a like a stool of your six ring um you 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 know what i'm drawing here right of these this being an atom this being an atom is it clear what i mean with these drawings here oh yeah that's uh actually a good point yeah and then you you now said if we know this guy, this guy, and this guy, then the, the other side is more or less predetermined. Um, but is that true? Yeah, <laughs> really I think you're right. For some reason, I don't understand. I assume that the rings are flat. But uh, that's a good point. Yeah, if we, but, but, but if we have an aromatic ring, um, yeah, if we have an aromatic ring, then I think oh yeah, it should be flat, ring. right? Uh, so, in your in the side chains, yeah. Now here comes the biology knowledge that I don't <laughs> have. And in the side chains, do we only have aromatic rings? We, uh, six member rings are all aromatic rings, and then there's in tryptophan there's five member rings, which is also aromatic, I think. So, and then proline should have non-aromatic ring, um, but it's also five-membered ring. So maybe the yeah. like distortion is not that large. It's like, maybe, yeah. Only the, the proline, 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 proline ring is aromatic. Yeah. Okay. I think so. Yeah, thank yeah. you for the... Yeah. Question. I just pulled up a, a, a list of guys. Yeah, it's the only problem. Anyway, so, sorry for the, the long interruption. We we have these internal coordinates that you predict with your decoder. And yeah. Yep. Now what? Now, uh, so uh, I will explain the reconstruction method in more detail. So uh, we both reconstruct the backbone and then side chain. And then back for backbone, this is from a uh, rule-based bank mapping paper, um, the previous work. And then in this paper, they say that uh, the peptide bond here, the oxygen here, and then the uh, nitrogen here, it's perpendicular to the plane that these three adjacent C alpha atoms forms. 
So the plane would be this triangle, and then the uh, peptide bond is this, so it's perpendicular. Um, and then here we can, you know, here the assumption is uh, given the positions of three adjacent uh, C alphas, we can predict the positions of backbone atoms. So, yeah, Hannes. Is that this, uh, maybe I missed it, but is that this back rub motion paper? Oh, it's not. It's a uh, back rub motion is uh, the way to define the protein backbone fluctuations. Um, and then this one is uh, from uh, back mapping, but non ML rule based back mapping paper. So you're saying like I now right I need to place four atoms, and you're saying that can be done with three internal coordinates like the torsion, the the bond angle between the n and the c, and the the distance of the c. Um. Yes and no. So we have uh now we have three atoms to place. Uh, here, the oxygen, carbon, and the nitrogen, right? Um, and then uh, the internal coordinate based placement is given the three anchor atoms, we can place the fourth atom uh, by defining the length and then angle and then torsional angle here. So we need three anchors. And then the idea here is to use three adjacent C alphas as three anchors. So for example, um, in this case, uh, the carbon can be placed, uh, carbon can be defined by uh, the distance uh, between carbon and then the adjacent C alpha, and then the angle between carbon C alpha and then the uh, next C alpha, and then the torsional angle between carbon C alpha, uh, the previous C alpha, yeah, the next C alpha and then previous C alpha. I see. And then uh, once we reconstruct all the backbone atoms, then we can start reconstructing the side chains. Uh, side chains are sequentially reconstructed, which means that uh, previously I said that there we need three anchors to place the fourth atom using the internal coordinates. So here we have the we have four uh, atoms that are available as an anchor in one residue. So for example, here the C beta will be defined um, from three anchors of C alpha and the nitrogen and carbon, and the C gamma will be defined from uh, C beta, C alpha, and then nitrogen, and so on and so on. And then uh, it doesn't take a lot of time because we reconstruct all residue at the same time. So uh, yeah, it's reconstructing all C beta at the same time and then reconstruct all C gamma at the same time. How do you, uh, yeah, how do you actually implement that? I, I read you have some appendix on that, but, but I didn't look at it. Um, yeah, how do you do the parallel, uh, the parallel conversion from internal to partition? Yeah, so uh, we have a, so uh, after the backbone reconstruction, we have O, C, N, C, alpha, uh, 3D coordinates for every residue. And then uh, the output of our decoder was the, uh, the length, bond angle, torsional angle for like all the other residue, all the other atoms. So given that, and given the 3D coordinates here, uh, we can, <clears throat> yeah, reconstruct. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah. Won't you run into like a, um, yeah, won't you run into an issue, for example, if now you run into there not being any more atoms left in your side chain, there, um, there comes now a ring in your side chain and yeah. How do yeah, you... yeah, that's a good question. So we just, uh, well, you know, the number of atoms in a residue ranges from, uh, I don't quite remember, but like from five to 13, I guess. And then uh, we just do max padding. And then, 
yeah, after all the reconstruction is done, just mask out the non-existing atom entries, if that makes sense. Okay, and we treat, but then don't we have to do with like some checks for particular side chains that if the next atom would be a ring, then, or it, it, just the start of the ring, then we need to, yeah, then we need to place it, but then we split up and then yeah. what do we do if we split up? Uh, we have some canonical ordering or? Yep, yep, uh, yep. So uh, I define the canonical orderings uh, in a way that it makes sense. So for example, here, uh, if we want to construct this nice atom, then I don't like the internal coordinate is uh, in a canonical way, it's bond length, bond angle, torsional angle. But then here, it's more like um, uh, here, the length is defined for this atom nine is uh, the distance between nine and eight because it's branched. And then the oh. angle is nine, eight, seven. So it's uh, the angles and lengths might not be existing uh, in a like bonding set, covalent bond sense, but uh, like it's same for the ring structures. It doesn't, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, this, uh, this makes sense. Uh, this, is, this is smart. Nice. Um, so, these are the learning objectives. So basically, uh, the, it's supervision on like how the reconstruction loss is <clears throat> consisted as uh, supervision on both internal coordinates and Cartesian coordinates. Um, and then I found that the supervision on Cartesian coordinates is also necessary because if we only supervise on internal coordinates, then um, it's hard to minimize uh, such things like steric clashes. So um yeah this is the supervision on internal coordinates the bond lengths and then the angle and torsional angle and then also their supervision on the uh yeah xyz coordinate and then this is the auxiliary steric loss where we penalize all the um like neighbor non-bonded pairs uh that is uh smaller than like within this uh 2.1 Armstrong. yes Hannes. Did you have uh, did you have ablations on the steric loss? Yep, yep, we did. Um, coming up, or oh, I have that in my paper, but okay. I didn't. No, no. Then just uh, does it actually help a lot, or just a little, or almost nothing? I well, it helped. Uh, it'll depend on how to define a lot, but it helped in significant amounts uh, in my perspective. So yeah, yes. because like only using this uh, Cartesian supervision doesn't like 100% penalize the steric clashes. So. But yeah, did you actually look at that quantitatively? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, cool. Now no, let's continue. Thank you. So this is uh, what basically my model does. Um, this is for a uh, protein unseen by the model during training. And then the input is the coarse grain trajectory and then output is all atom trajectory. So now I will show the ablation study results. I haven't included the ablation study for lost terms, but uh, you can see those in yeah. table two of my paper. So. Yep, the first study is uh, on transferability. Um, so this is the ground truth structure. And then uh, the B structure is uh, my model, which is trained on many, many different proteins, but not trained on this test protein. Um, and then the structure D is at the same model architecture, but then it's only trained on the this protein. Um, and then uh, qualitatively, it shows that uh, the transferable model uh, does a little bit better than the single chemistry model. Uh, here, like, you know, there are some broken bonds, uh, even though we uh, use internal coordinates. And also, 
uh, C and E are the previous OGS CGVAE. I tweaked uh, model architecture a little bit so that this uh, can be trained for many examples. Um, and then the E structure is CGVAE trained on, just trained on the, uh, this protein. And then it shows that um, uh, for CGVAE, the single chemistry version actually seems to do better qualitatively, but then still it's uh, not as good as the uh, transferable version of ours. So to me, um, looking at these images, it's just they look all the same and there's no difference oh. between any of them. Okay, <laughs> thank you for pointing that out. So <laughs> I think we need to see two things. First thing is the um, reconstruction of the topology if the topology is preserved. So here we see many uh, broken bonds and also there are some bonds that there shouldn't be there. Um, and then the second thing is uh, how the ground truth structure is well reconstructed. Yeah, so uh, apparently the CGVAE ones are uh, have more broken bonds, more bad bonds, um, okay, then, yeah. uh, like here, um, the 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 non-overfitted model, so M one, I guess, looks almost perfect, um, and it looks better than the M five. Yep. Why yep. is? Um. So, how we train this? Uh, how we did this test is. Training the, we trained the model on, like for the single chemistry model, we trained the model on part of the protein ensemble and then tested on another part of the ensemble. No. So, yeah, it's possible that it doesn't really uh, generalize well. Um, yeah, that, that makes sense. But um, like, what is actually the evaluation we would be interested in? We, no, this is exactly the thing that we would be interested in, right? If we have some some input, then uh, we want to be able to, um, yeah, we have some input. We want to be able to coarse grain it, run our MD, and then arrive at some completely different ensemble structures or uh, ensemble of structures, and then decode it there, and then look at the decoded stuff there. So yeah. it's kind of exactly what we what you care about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Um, and quantitatively, uh, the numbers also follows the same trend. So this is the our model, like our transferable model. It shows the lowest RMSD in terms of Armstrong. Um, and then the uh, CGVAE, the previous uh, transferable model. Uh, it shows very high RMSD, but it becomes better when it's like overfitted on the, the single chemistry. But then uh, this our architecture, uh, the non-overfitted, the transferable version actually does better. And then the second ablation study is on the equivariance of the encoder. So here we want to compare this uh, B and C structure. Um, the B structure is coming from our model architecture, which we used equivariant encoder and prior. And then the uh, C structure is from invariant encoder and prior. Uh, it looks pretty similar uh, qualitatively. And uh, quantitatively, it's slightly worse. The invariant version is slightly worse. Um, but still, we can see that equivariant encoding and um, prior helped. And then we think it's because um, the uh... Soju, your the, the audio became very poor all of a sudden. Is it okay now? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, what did I say? Oh yeah, the orientation of the uh, residues are important. So I guess that's why equivariance mattered. 
And then uh, the third ablation study is on the decoder degrees of freedom. Here we can see more dramatic change um, from the uh, in our internal coordinate based decoder to Cartesian coordinate based decoders. Uh, so structure D and E shows the case where we use Cartesian coordinate decoders. Uh, there's one. I'll I'll read the question soon. Uh, yeah, you can continue. On. Uh, I'll take care of the question. Yeah, and then uh, you can see that uh, the force the structure E invariant encoder and the Cartesian coordinate decoder, it shows a uh, better structure compared to uh, the model, the structure D, but then still there are many uh, broken bonds and then like the topology is not uh, kept well as much as our model. Then quantitatively, it follows the same trend. So the RMSD values uh, for the uh, Cartesian coordinate decoders are like much, much worse. And also, our, these yeah. are pretty, pretty expected, right? Yep, um, yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe let's chat a little bit about the, the steric clash. Oh, no. First of all, here you're now just uh, you're looking at these four proteins like would people usually complain to you about that you're only looking at four proteins and like not showing average numbers over like let's say at least 20 if you have 257 training structures well that's a good point um and then i think the complaint is fair uh we tested on four proteins because the PED database had limited numbers of entries. And then we didn't want to like spare a lot of uh, entries for testing and not used for training um, just to make our model better. Um, and then even though we only had four test proteins, uh, they are all like completely unseen by the model. And then we are, and then still it's like giving really nice um, quality. Yeah. So we are pretty sure that uh, for other proteins, the model will show similar uh, performance. And then we, uh, I tested the model on like few, uh, few of other like structures from other like data sets. And then it seemed uh, pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even though I couldn't include those in my result because like they aren't ensemble structures, so we couldn't compare the distributions. Okay, all right. And steric clash ratio is mm -hmm. always like 0.1% only, or 0.2%, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this will depend on how we, uh, define the steric clash, but uh, my criteria was 1.2 Armstrong, and then I think it's it was pretty uh, like conservative. So uh, maybe like if we increase the uh, threshold to like 1.3, 1.4, then this would change. This would like increase. Um, but then, yeah, that, that was my criteria. And then within that criteria, it really showed um, like barely, you know, there were yeah. many steric clashes. And we have in the chat, so please clarify uh, if here in all of these experiments, are you using the prior network or the encoder network? To other? Yeah, yeah. So are you using the are you using the coarse grained representation mm -hmm. to get the latent from which you decode, or are you using the um, the fine grained the, the atom all atom representation? And it has to be the coarse grained representation that you encode, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So the ablation studies here are all using the encoder, but then the result I'll show from now on are all from uh, samplings. Oh, 
Yeah. So okay. Well, oops, I didn't say that. Um. <laughs> so then, when I said this is what we care about, actually, then this is definitely not what we care about, right? We care about the the performance that we get when we have the actual encodings where not only your decoder has to be good, also your uh, your encoder of the um, of only the uh, yeah of only the what do you call it of all the coarse grain stuff has to be good so yeah yeah, yeah. that's the, exactly what we care about yeah so more or less the results that you showed previously these aren't what we would have in the in the real world when we actually use your method right mm -mm. yeah okay. um but uh i should have included the structures of the samplings but uh i can show you guys later um, so here is the metrics from the sample structures. Um, and then, uh, you know, like for sample structures, the assumption is we don't have the, the ground truth. So we cannot like compare the RMSD. And then, so this GED is graph added distance, which measures the topology change. Um, and then it's like similar to uh, the sampled version Oh shoot, what? Sorry, the sorry, the uh the table is weird. Uh this should be this should be uh, 55, this should be 90, this should be 151, this should be 218. Sorry for that. Um yeah, and then it's like similarly low to the reconstructed structures. So I call structures from encoder reconstructed, and then I call structures from uh, only CG structure uh, to, you know, uh, that goes into prior as sample structures. So these are all from sample structures. And then ceramic clash ratio, um, they, like it was 0 0.1 for 0 0.142, uh, now it increased to like 0 0.5, like 0 0.7. So it's a bit worse. Um, and then the third criteria is uh, RMSD generation. This is the standard deviation of the RMSD. Wait, wait um, yeah, which measures the uh, structural diversity. So actually for this metric, uh, the higher, the better. Like it's not comparing the ground truth structure and then the generator structures is uh, measuring the uh, variance between the generator structures. Um, and then here- uh, well, well, Like this is also not a fair statement, right? That uh, necessarily higher, better. If you have a, a coarse grain structure for which there's really only one uh, fine yeah. grain structure that makes sense, then you want this also to be zero, no? Yeah, that's true, that's true. So to be uh, fair, like to, you know, evaluate properly, then we will have to compare the distributions. Um, and then I am still working on how to quantitatively compare to distributions because uh, of the results I'm gonna show you guys now. So these are the, uh, the distributions of, uh, backbone torsion angles. And then here the color scheme is blue points are true ground truth structures. Uh, the yellow points are reconstructed structures, the structures from encoder. And then the pink ones are uh, structures from prior, which only have seen the uh, coarse grain structure. And then it pretty much, uh, well, we can only compare qualitatively here but I think it's doing pretty well, even though there are some parts that uh, the uh, encoder is covering, but then the prior is not. And then here is a better, uh, like more comprehensive. These are for side chains mostly. Um, and then the color scheme is the same. The blue is the true. And then yellow is reconstructed, and then uh, pink is the sample structures, and then those are for all for torsional angles, side chain torsional angles. Um, okay, so, so what we care about is blue versus 
like blue is what it should look like and pink is what you produce. Yep, 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 yep. Yep, exactly. Um, so here you can see that, you know, for some parts it's doing really well. And the, here uh, the x-axis is like really narrow, so it'll be doing well in the uh, long distance. Um, but then uh, the limitation here is that it's not getting all the modes. And then we think it's because of uh, its intrinsic problem of VAE. Um, you know, minimizing KL divergence, we can minimize it like without getting all the modes. So I think that's what's happening. So it could be a problem of uh, not so much expressive prior, or it could be um, problem mm. of learning. So, but we still have samples from, in our data, we still have samples from these other modes as well. So we shouldn't have like a mode seeking behavior issue here, right? Um, well, but still, uh, yeah. So uh, like the, yeah, I don't think the uh, mode seekingness of KL mm. um, would be an issue here. Like it, the, the KL divergence is going the right way around, so to say, such that it is mode covering. Okay. Uh, when we're training that we here, we are not 100% not sure. But uh, anyway, the so wouldn't the ideal test be to do something like, um, yeah, we just, like, why are you saying we cannot really make quantitative comparisons so nicely? Wouldn't the ideal test be to just encode this? Or, yeah, no, we, we just have a bunch of structures of an unseen protein. We do our coarse graining of them. Um, we don't coarse grain them with your VAE or with your encoder. We coarse grain them with uh, method X, method Y, and method whatever. And then we have this coarse grain thingy. And then we decode it. And then we look at the RMSDs. Why, why is that not a good thing? Uh... Well, it's because, so one coarse grain structure can correspond to many all atom structures. Yeah. So we don't really know uh, which all atom conformation will this, you know, uh, CG structure will correspond to. Like we need a ground truth to compare, right? Yeah, so, but I mean, you can make it like somewhat like on average, it's a low RMSD, so uh, I'm happy. But of course, it can happen that for um, for one CG representation, there are now many, many, many plausible um, configurations of the the all atom structure, and maybe like then the the perfect evaluation would be that you try to fix one CG structure, and then you, you try to look at the ensemble of all atom structures around it, all right? And then you have a distribution of all these collective variables, like the angle or the other angle or some distances. And then you can look at the KL divergence of the distribution of the MD, and the KL divergence of the thing that you reconstructed. Yeah, that's uh, basically what I did here, except for the quantitative KL divergence part. So this- uh, oh, No, I thought here you have, don't you have multiple? Um, don't you have multiple? Okay, so how do you then here define the cost? Like the cost grain structure here is always the same, is that right? Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, this uh, plot includes multiple first green structures. Like this is okay. the statistics. Yeah, mm -hmm. but these statistics are now like not uh, not 
distributions yeah. of representing um, the angles that they have in reality if you have one set of CG coordinates. All right. Yeah. Um, do yeah, you have many uh, examples? Sure. Uh, so one one thing to add is uh, uh, like our ground truth data set, um, it doesn't always show all possible atomic confirmations. Yeah, so, you will have yes. to run the MD yourself, I guess. Uh, compare, sometimes it's hard to compare like for one single sample. And then even when we do like average, uh, might not be plausible. Yeah, but I see what you mean. Yeah, I, I can could imagine you can just set up like an open MM simulation. We yeah, have, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you, you, uh, but when, when you do an update of your coordinates, you then say, nope, um, the alpha carbons, I don't update. I keep them fixed. And um, I'm not sure if you then get an issue with not actually getting the Boltzmann or this marginal Boltzmann distribution um, of uh, the rest of the atoms being right, but yeah, whatever. Um, uh, do you think, are there any other results you really want to show or? It's uh, pretty much done. <laughs> so the next slide is summary slide. Um, oh, it's already 12. Uh, oh, yeah. So we're good. Summary... We're fine. Okay. Sounds good. Um, yeah, to, and then for Hannah's point, I think it's a good point. Uh, we definitely need to think more about that. Um, and then as a summary, what I learned from uh, this is first protein all atom conformations can be inferred across chemical systems given the residual level resolution structure. Um, and then also the equivariant message passing captures the local geometry required for backlapping and finally generating an internal coordinate space helps preserving the topology and results in better generation quality. Yep, so I think now I'm ready for, ready to take questions. And we'll do that after I say uh, many thanks for your presentation and for answering a bunch of my questions already. But yeah, we have a bunch of questions in the chat. Let's get to some of them. Um, did you try to just infer the sequences that fit to CG coordinates? Um, are you aware of what is the question? Yeah. Did you try just infer the sequences that fit to CG coordinates? Mm, does that mean? Um, or uh, if you're in during your testing, during your inference tests, did you only try to um, run inference? that fit to uh, for the structures uh, where the encoded stuff fits to like the, what your encoder produced fits to what a usual um, this coarse grainer would produce. And that's not the case, right? Because you we saw the discrepancy. Oh, oh yeah, you did try it. And yes, we see a difference between the sampled stuff uh, and the, the encoder stuff. Uh, sorry, I don't think I'm getting. So, wait, the question is. So my understanding of the question is that it's about, um, I mean, it's there are some new updates, uh, that it's about whether you only did the, um, the reconstruction stuff where you encode with your uh, encoder, or if you also encoded with a, uh, with some other coarse graining method and then decode it. And yeah, you also did the second thing, right? And you mean like not uh, going from C alpha to all atom, but like using different coarse graining scheme? Is that like? Um, what, what do you mean? If you go from C alpha to all atom? Yeah. <clears throat> Ah, okay. No, no, no. no. Um, uh, yeah, I'm just making the distinction between the sampling and uh, your uh, between sampling okay. and reconstruction. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. 
that you also do uh, anyway um also if we get a uh, if we just get a rough side chain geometry from rule based models then apply force fields for yeah. example m that is actually sorry sorry yeah getting yeah. Rough side chain geometry from rule based models and then optimizing is uh like that is the uh how to say like popular procedure um so i also tried the method, but uh, so my method, it takes 0 0.006 second for one geometry uh, for the PED 00055 case. Um, but then the other method, it uh, took more than four seconds, almost five seconds per one structure. So it's like much slower. And then, yeah, that is the issue. The quality should be nice because we do relaxation and optimization, but it takes time. Okay, and then we have a nice question. Um, did you compare or make any comparisons of the energy uh, of the energy? Or did you ever look at uh, energies that uh, the produced or the sampled structures have that you did you generate? Mm, no, uh, we didn't train on energy. We didn't test on energy. But the ideal case will be the uh, reconstructed all atom distribution follows the Boltzmann distribution. So I think that could be it's what the marginal Boltzmann distribution. Yeah, marginal like, Boltzmann the distribution. CFL. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it could be worth testing. Uh, maybe it could be test along with the uh, method Hannes suggested the M open MMMD. Um, okay, and the conditional. Um, yeah. Not the one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Condition on the CG structure. Um, I was curious why invariant message passing is in insufficient in this case. Oh yeah. Um, so the encoder should be able to capture, encoder or prior should be able to capture uh, the surrounding geometry, which is not, um, uh, how to say, like, if we use invariant encoder, then the like, you know, there can be many surrounding residues, uh, and then uh, maybe we can uh, represent the orientation as these vectors, and then we want to we want the, this node to know the information how uh, the vectors around it itself is you know directed at. So. That's why we need equivariant encoder. But then the decoder needs to be invariant because the internal coordinates are invariant properties. Like it shouldn't be changed upon rotations. I, I think that that should be helpful enough. Um, I want to go for one more question that I find very nice. Uh, what do you think are the most important like did you make any comparisons in terms of how well you can generalize to the unseen protein did you yeah make any comparisons of, for that for the samples like for the, the thing that we actually care about the not the reconstruction but for the sampling and there yeah what makes the stuff generalizable what makes the stuff not have many steric clashes and go, yeah what is the what are the the most important um aspects there and i guess maybe if you go to your plots uh, in the in the slides down um can you go to to some plots yep uh like if you just skip through the slides here and go down oh. and then back 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 
back the way you show some structures oh no, this, actually i uh, think uh the no. structure should be oh uh, yeah yeah here for example mm, we have plots like this for sampling yeah 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 let me uh are you guys still seeing my powerpoint yep so this sorry for not including enough number of plots in my presentation so this one shows this one is also in the paper uh this one shows the sample structures as well and then they are all for um like these four proteins are all unseen by the model during training and then it's i sampled uh, for one structure i sampled for 10 times and then just overlapped all the possible structures all right another md or molecule related paper covered here and well we probably have more of these in the future so if you want to see them in the future yourself in person or well virtually i guess but to be able to ask your own questions do so by joining the reading group and all of that information is in the description